Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. For those of you who do not know, Douglas Wilson has a talk show called Man Rampant. And Man Rampant has a brand new home on the Canon app. He interviews guests for about an hour about all things relating to masculinity and the Christian life. This week, we've dropped several episodes of season two, one with Peter Hitchens, one with Oz Guinness, and one with E. Michael Jones. Tune in to hear Pastor Douglas Wilson interview fascinating folks about fascinating topics, all pertaining to masculinity. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Douglas Wilson. This is episode 169. Welcome. Good to have you. So, I want to talk this episode a little bit about the neutrality myth. This is something that evangelicals have been talking about, at least since, uh, talking about on a widespread level, at least since the time of Francis Schaeffer. But I think the, the neutrality myth has gotten so ingrained in our our institutions and our customs, that it's going to take, we're going to need to spend a lot of time in the detox center before we have actually dealt with the neutrality myth. So what do I mean by this? Well, the neutrality myth is the myth that undergirds the great experiment of secularism. Secularism is the idea that men can govern themselves and can organize themselves in human societies without a transcendental grounding. We don't need a transcendental arch over us. We can just figure out what seems good to us. We can use common sense. We can uh, hold hands together, agree on certain shared values, and take it from there. And then you can go home and in the privacy of your own home or behind your eyelids or in between your ears, you may think your religious thoughts. You may believe in Jesus there, or you could go home and be a Muslim at home, or you could go home and be a Hindu at home. So, uh, our public shared commitments are like a a bowl of flavorless oatmeal. Uh, And we we all have the oatmeal, whether you're a Muslim or a Hindu or an agnostic or an atheist, everybody shares the oatmeal. And then you go home and you add condiments uh, to flavor to your taste. The, the condiments are kept in your fridge. They're kept in your home. So you can take the oatmeal home and put brown sugar on it, or you can take the oatmeal home and put fruit on it. You can take the oatmeal home and put walnuts on it, you know, whatever you, whatever you want. But the oatmeal is neutral. The oatmeal is something that we all share together, and the oatmeal doesn't require a transcendental grounding. The problem with this, uh, uh, the naked, uh, Richard John Newhouse uh, referred to the, wrote a book called The Naked Public Square. One of the things that we're seeing, and, and I don't th- he did not live to see it, but if you insist on a naked public square, it's just going to be a matter of time before you have naked people in the public square. And that's precisely where we have gone. The naked public square has resulted in pride parades. The naked public square has resulted in a devolution down into the worst excesses of the sexual revolution. And this is, uh, so the the neutrality myth can be exposed if you simply ask a couple of questions. These are questions that kids know how to ask on every playground. The two, they're the two great philosophical questions. Why and who says? Why and who says? Well, the neutrality, we have, to, we have to come together and respect all worldviews equally. Why? Who says we have to do that? Why do we have to do that? Why is that treated as self-evident? Well, you, you want all religious beliefs to be treated equally, don't you? No, absolutely not. It was religious beliefs that caused people to fly airplanes into skyscrapers. Those were religious beliefs. And the people who did it, were entirely dedicated to their religious beliefs. Our word thug comes from um, a religious group in India 
They were the thuggies. They were high high women, bandits, whose religion consisted of robbing people. Right. So, um, religious practices have been used to sanctify the worst excesses that human beings have been able to think up. It was religion that took beating hearts out of sacrificial victims on Aztec pyramids. You can't say all religions are equal. Oh, no, no. Um, I meant, the person says, we meant all religions are equal if they allow themselves to be neutered and brought into a secular framework. But those, those aren't religions. Those, are, those aren't uh, religions out in their native habitat. Those are domesticated religions, and they've been domesticated and house-trained to live in the secular house. But a secularized Muslim who agrees to live there, and a secularized Hindu who agrees to live there, and, worst of all, a secularized Christian who agrees to live there, they're not the genuine articles. They're neutered house pets. We want the real thing. We want, we want genuine religion, heartfelt religion. And, and this is uh, something else that, else that is a crucial element. As a Christian, I would like the essential elements to, be, to uh, include the characteristic of being true. So it, it, it can't just be a heartfelt religion. It should be a true religion. And so consequently, that means that I, if someone says, do you want the United States to be a Christian nation, to, be, to explicitly reckon in our founding documents, in our constitution, or somewhere like that. Do you want us to recognize that this world is a world in which Jesus rose from the dead? The answer to that question is yes. Continuing on with episode 169 of the podcast, and we've come to our hamartiology section. Hamartiology is the study of sin, and we are looking at the different Greek words for various sins in the New Testament. The word we are considering this week is blopto, and is the word for hurt. Blopto, and is the word for hurt. And we see it used in Luke 4.35. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. There's the word blopto, and hurt him not. Now, in other instances, we see that demons who had possession of their victims took some kind of pleasure in hurting their hosts. We can think of Legion, who used to cut himself with stones, and of the boy that Christ healed uh, right after he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. That demon used to cast the boy into the fire, for example. In this instance, Jesus cast the unclean devil out of the man who was there in the synagogue, and it makes a point of saying that the demon did not hurt him as though there were a better than even chance that he might hurt him. In other words, it was notable that, he, uh, th- that the demon came out without hurting the man. Now, either th- that is a statement on what demons usually do, or since the man involved is, was there in the synagogue, he was a known character in town, he was a known character, uh, and, and he may have had a history of hurting himself. And so it was remarkable that the demon came out quietly. The other instance of the word is talking about an inanimate thing, poison, but it is in the context of conflict with evil. So in Mark 16, 18, it says, They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. There there you go. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Speaking metaphorically of our engagement with the principalities and powers, the how we uh, are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. When we go out preaching the gospel, if we drink any deadly thing, we will not be hurt by it. Blopto. So, with the podcast 169, uh, we come now to our book review. Uh, the book review I'm uh, the book I'm reviewing here is a short little book uh, by Malcolm Muggeridge. Uh, called The End of Christendom. The End of Christendom. Now, he, uh, what Muggeridge is addressing are sort of the, the ossified or fossilized shell of Christian, of, of, of the living faith of previous generations, uh, but 
which no longer has that living faith. And he says, of course, that that sort of thing is just another human institution, and it must come crashing down. So, a muggeridge is not talking about the end of Christian faith or the end of true Christian experience or the end of Christ. He is talking about the end of Christendom. Our Western culture has a lot of Christian vestiges, and uh, they are eroding. They're, they're falling apart as we speak. Well, Muggeridge, um, a lot of them were falling apart uh, during Muggeridge's day, and our, the decay is advanced now. This is a, it's a delightful little book. It's a couple of lectures he gave in commemoration of Blaise Pascal, a great Christian thinker. And uh, Muggeridge was a journalist, a journalist and an editor for much of his life in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, he was one of the few uh, people who dealt with the lies that were being promulgated about the Soviet Union. He's one of the few people who, who reacted to those lies honestly. Some of you uh, know that I'm a big P.G. Woodhouse uh, fan, and P.G. Woodhouse was a very successful writer in the first part of the 20th century. And, um, and, he, and some people know that he was taken prisoner by the Germans in the Second World War. He was a British citizen who was, who was in France. He was seized by the Germans. And he wound up spending some time in a camp, not a concentration camp, but, well, it was a nicer sort of concentration camp than, than the famous ones that the Germans ran. But so he was interned there. And while, he, while Woodhouse was held by the Germans, he made, uh, he made a series of broadcasts that were very ill-advised. He, he was just um, doing some humorous light broadcasts, and the Germans wanted to use it for propaganda purposes, and Woodhouse was naive enough to not see the politics involved. So, what, ha what happened was, of course, Britain is beleaguered and fighting in this desperate war with Nazi Germany, and they turned on uh, Woodhouse like, a, like he was an awful traitor. He didn't do anything traitorous or treasonous or anything at all, uh, and the story has a happy ending. He, after the war, uh, Woodhouse didn't go back to England because of the hostility to him because of those broadcasts. He came to the United States, eventually became a, a U.S. citizen, and continued to write on Long Island. But eventually, in the 1970s, I think it was, he was knighted by the, by the Queen, Sir Woodhouse, uh, Sir Pelham. And so all was forgiven and everything was fixed. But during the dark days, when, when everything was really bad, uh, Malcolm Muggeridge looked him up and was a great encouragement to Woodhouse. Muggeridge was a courageous, tenacious truth seeker. And at, th at that time, he was not a professing Christian. He wasn't a Christian at that time. He became a Christian late in life. And s some of his uh, reactions to certain things, as this older man who became a Christian, someone who was dedicated to telling the truth his whole life, uh, uh, finally found the truth, encountered the truth in Christ. Uh, you can see that Muggeridge is entranced by the person of Jesus, and he's not afraid to say outrageous things. So, um, these are two like this is a small bound volume of two lectures, and uh, they include the Q&A that followed the lectures uh, in the book. And one of the questioners asks Muggeridge what he thinks of the theory of evolution. And Muggeridge says, uh, very briefly, winsomely, that in retrospect, he believes that evolution will be seen to have been one of the great jokes of history. He's not afraid to just si simply say it. He is very insightful, very good. Uh, the End of Christendom by Malcolm Muggeridge. Hunt it down. Mm -hmm.